In this video, we're going to look at some of the methods of research within the cognitive approach. Now, there are seven different types of research that you need to know about by the end of the course. Now, the top three, as you can see there, are different types of experiment, and they differ in the level of manipulation put in place by the psychologist. We've got lab experiments, field experiments, and natural experiments. Now, an experiment will always have an IV and a DV, and the IV will always be manipulated and the DV will always be measured. Now, the idea with an experiment is to attain a cause and effect relationship between the IV and the DV. Now, this means that whatever was changed within the IV has caused a direct effect upon the DV. It's important to remember here that control and realism within these experiments is a bit like a seesaw. So, for example, the more control you have, the less realism or ecological validity you have. Take a lab experiment, for example. In a lab experiment, lots of controls are put into place to reduce any variables inter interfering with the cause and effect relationship between the IV and the DV. However, in order to be able to put all these controls in place, the result is often a very low realistic outcome, which lacks ecological validity in terms of whether the participant's behaviour can be generated to real life. In a lab experiment, the key words that you need to be including are artificial controlled environment. The DV is deliberately um, measured so that the IV is manipulated to see if it has an effect on the DV. Participants in this situation will know that they're being studied and because of that it has low ecological validity. In terms of the strengths and weaknesses of lab experiments, lab experiments is help us to draw conclusions or causal conclusions, which is a cause and effect relationship between the IV and the DV. They allow us to control extraneous or confounding variables, which are things that will impact upon the results. And because of this, they're often very reliable in the sense of they can be replicated. However, they are also artificial in the sense of they lack ecological validity because they're not like a real life setting. And investigator and participant effects can often have a, an effect on this because of the fact that this setting is artificial. So, for example, participants' behaviours might not be natural. A field experiment is in a more natural environment, so for example the street or a school. The IV is still deliberately manipulated and the DV is still measured in the participant's own environment. The participants are often unaware that they're being studied, which gives it greater ecological validity. You can still draw causal conclusions from a field experiment, so you can still talk about a cause and effect relationship between the IV and the DV, but it also has highly ecological validity. It avoids some participant effects because participants don't know that they're being studied and therefore don't change their behaviour in that way. However, it is less controlled and the likelihood of an extraneous or a confounding variable impacting upon the cause and effect relationship is much higher than within a lab experiment. They can also be more time consuming to set up to put the, co the controls in place. So, for example, if you think about trying to set up an experiment in a school, you would have to take the displays down. You might have to cover up the windows. You might have to ensure that nobody interferes or tries to enter that room during the day. And the last one is a natural experiment. Now, a natural experiment is what it says in the tin. It is a naturally existing environment, and the IV cannot be manipulated by the psychologist. It's changed by a natural occurrence, and we are still measuring the DV. In this situation, participants may or may not know that they're being studied, and it gives us greater ecological validity because it's much more like real life. It allows research to take place where the IV can't be manipulated, so for example hospitals or schools, and it allows us to study real life problems. Now natural experiments are often done in developmental psychology, which often looks at child psychology and study of children. The weaknesses are that they cannot allow us to demonstrate a cause and effect relationship between the IV and the DV, because the IV isn't being purposely manipulated by the experimenter. Often, a lot of confounding variables or extraneous variables will interfere with the result and therefore allow us to not draw causal conclusions. You also need to know about experimental designs, which is how participants are used within experiments. A field experiment is in a more natural environment, so for example the street or a school. The IV is still deliberately manipulated and the DV is still measured in the participant's own environment. The participants are often unaware that they're being studied, which gives it greater ecological validity. Now the experimental design, we're manipulating the IV and there are often two values of the IV, for example noise or no noise, and this will determine the conditions of the experiment. So for example condition one would be with noise, condition two would be with no noise. 
An experiment will often have at least two conditions, an experimental condition where something's changed and a control condition where nothing's changed that allows us to make comparisons between the two. For experimental designs, you need to know R, I, M, repeated measures, independent measures and a match pairs design. A repeated measures design is quite simple. You recruit a group of participants and all of these participants do condition one and then all of these participants do condition two. Now this allows us to compare the results for the two conditions. This is good because any differences are likely to be controlled. Now this means that participant effects won't have um, an effect in terms of everybody that you are comparing will have the same IQ because it's the same person. So this means that the causal relationship between the IV and the DV can be clearer and you know that the comparisons are easier to make. Fewer participants often have to be recruited because you're using the same participants for both of the um, conditions. However, order effects such as the fact that they might have practiced, so in the second condition they might have got better results because they practiced the experiment and not because of an influence of the IV on the DV. They might get tired, they might start to work out what the experiment's about and therefore display demands characteristics where they're behaving in a way that they think is expected of them by the experimenter. The second one you need to know is independent measures design. So you recruit your group of participants and you split them in half. Half of your participants do condition one and half of your participants do condition two. And then you measure the DV for each group. You compare the results from the groups. Now in this, there are no order effects. So the participants aren't gonna get tired or demand characteristics or practice what they're doing because they're only doing one condition. And it allows for task variables to be controlled. For example, participants can be given the same word list within each condition so that the word list doesn't become a confounding variable. However, any differences between the conditions could be due to individual differences. So for example, one group might have a higher IQ than the second group, or one group might just have a better memory than the second group, and therefore it's much more difficult to be able to draw conclusions between the IV and the DV and see how much of a difference your experimental con uh, condition has had. The last one you need to know is match pairs designs. So you recruit your group of participants, and you work out what type of people you've got within this group. You then recruit another group of participants and you try and match them to your original group of participants. Now this might be for IQ or age or gender. You then have condition one and then condition two and you compare the results. Now this is good because there are no other effects because each participant only takes part in one of their experiments so they're not going to get tired, they're not going to get demand characteristics or practice effects interfering with the results. The individual differences are controlled because you've matched the participants. So for example, if participant 1 has got a 79 in an IQ test, the participant 2 within the second condition will also have a 79 IQ, which therefore ensures that intelligence isn't a confounding variable which is impacting upon the results. However, in order to match the participants, this can become very time consuming and actually very expensive in order to be able to match the participants. Now I've mentioned before practice effect boredom and fatigue effect. Now this is fatigue effect is where to, um, performance of participants will deteriorate because they become tired. Practice effect is what it says on the tin where they've practiced the experiment so any improvement might be due to familiarity with the task and not genuine improvement. And these can be problems with repeated measures designs. Now you could leave a long gap between the conditions or use an independent measures group instead or a counterbalance design which we'll talk about later. Counterbalancing is important when you're using a repeated measures design because this reduces carryover effects. So what I mean by this is if you have half the participants doing condition A and then B and then half of the participants doing condition B and then A. So all of your participants are still doing both of your conditions but they're doing them in a different order. Participant variables are variables that can affect the results based on who a participant is. So this could mask an effect, which means you accept the null hypothesis, or it could mean that you accept that there was a change when there wasn't. This can be a problem with independent measures group design. You can control this with randomization, so randomly assigning participants to the groups. We talked about variables quite a lot. You're obviously very familiar with the independent variable and the dependent variable, but the specification says that you need to be confident in discussing extraneous variables, situational variables, participant variables, and confounding variables. An extraneous variable is one that might interfere with the dependent variable. So something other than the IV that will have an effect on the DV. And often that can mask the effect that the IV has on the DV. 
Now researchers should always try and eliminate or minimise these effects and these can be random factors that affect the IV such as noise outside when you're trying to do a memory test. To control extraneous variables, you could implement a standardised procedure, so participants will all get exactly the same experience. Now, this might be through the use of standardised instructions or a standardised task. You can counterbalance, so change the order of the experimental design, randomly allocate the participants to groups, or you might use a single or double blind design or use a large sample to spread out any unique characteristics. A confounding variable is like an extraneous variable, but a confounding variable is one that has definitely interfered with the DV and therefore it has confounded or changed the results. Part confounding variables can also be a participant or a situational variable. Think of a confounding variable as an umbrella term, including both participant and situational variables. Now, a situational variable is a variable from the situation. So, for example, something in the environment where the study has been conducted. So this might be things like a loud noise or a cold temperature, asking people at night to try and remember things. Participant variables refer to the way in which participants differ from each other. So this might be differences in IQ, reading ability, um, learning disabilities, the fact that they're tired or even gender and age. The point is that both of these can have a distorting effect on your data and every single experimenter should be trying to control these as much as possible. Now, in order to control situational variables, you can counterbalance the results as we talked about. So you split the group in half and one does one condition first and the other does condition B first and then you swap. So after that, condition one will do condition... Condition one will do condition two and condition two will do condition one. Nice. This will balance out any effects within the order. Order effects is the effect that you can have within a repeated measures where participants may practice and therefore get better the second time or by the second time they're bored or they're tired and that will influence upon the results. We've talked about demand characteristics a lot. Now demand characteristics is where a participant forms an interpretation of the purpose of the experiment and changes their behaviour accordingly and this might be unconscious so they've not done it on purpose. In order to control for demand characteristics, you can use distractor questions or lie about the aim of your experiment like Milgram did, or you can use a single blind design where the participant is unaware of which condition that they're in. Experimenter variables refers to, or the experimenter effect refers to a situation where the experimenter has influenced the results. Now this might be that they've given a cue or a signal to the participants, potentially by accident, that will have interfered with the results. These experimenter variables need to be controlled because this might be a situation where the experimenter's pre-existing opinion or something that they're trying to prove has subconsciously affected the results. To control these, you could do a double blind design where neither the researcher or the participant knows which condition they're in. This means they don't know what results they want to obtain from that particular condition and therefore can't influence them. Or you could use inter-rater reliability, where there is more than one researcher interpreting the results. Therefore, you're ensuring that they can check their opinions with each other to make sure that they both agree on the results. The specification says that you need to know...